Hello, everyone. My name is Daniele Caramani, and I will be chairing this session today. Welcome to the second seminar of the EGPP seminar series this year. Today's speaker is Philippe Genschel, who holds the joint chair in comparative and European public policy at the Department of Social and Political Science uh, and at the Robert Schumann uh, Center. Unfortunately, he cannot be with us uh, today in the Badia Fiesolana. We nonetheless very much look forward to his talk on post-functionalism -function reversed, solidarity and reboarding during the Corona crisis. To those attending online, please keep uh, your microphones muted, but do not turn off the video if possible. To those attending in the room, when you speak, switch on the microphone so that the camera turns toward you. We have a 30 minute presentation followed by Q&A, alternating questions between audience in the room and uh, the audience online. Philip, the floor is yours. Thank you, Daniela, for uh, the uh, invitation and thank you for the audience uh, for attending. Now, for a long time, I thought the worst thing that could happen this year was COVID-19. Uh, this morning, I had uh, different ideas, but uh, that's not the topic of my talk today. Uh, the talk today is about uh, post-functionalism reversed. And, um, you know, in, in January, uh, Frank Schimmelfennig asked us to ask Markus Jachtenfuchs, this joint work with Markus, and uh, uh, I to participate in a special issue on borders. And frankly, we didn't know what to write. And then came the Corona crisis and the Corona crisis was a lot about borders. And so we decided to um, uh, do something on Corona borders. Now our theoretical um, point of departure was post-functionalism because post-functionalism has emerged in recent years as the dominant crisis diagnostics for explaining uh, crisis events in the EU. And, and basically the basic idea of um, post-functionalism is that integration is, is shaped by two different uh, logics that often work at cross purposes. One is the logic of uh, functional uh, scale and, uh, you know, in the post-functionalist reading, um, uh, the size of functional scale is determined by uh, efficiency reasons, and these efficiency reasons push towards uh, large scale. So the search for efficiency uh, will drive towards an enlargement of uh, uh, governance scales. The second uh, logic at work is uh, what they call the logic of political uh, community and this in, um, in their reading and the post-functionalist reading a small and national for reasons of trust and uh, identity. And the crisis that we have been observing in recent decades uh, reflect the increased tensions between these different logics uh, driving towards uh, uh, different scales. So the crisis often created a functional demand for upscaling, but at the same time led to a politicization of issues of national uh, identity and this politicization pushed towards uh, downscaling. And it was this uh, tension between um, um, functional upscaling and political downscaling that um, uh, created these uh, 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 feelings of political crisis. The EU had to do for functional reasons what undermined its political um, legitimacy and vice versa. And this led to political drama, frustration, disappointment, et cetera. And, and the various crises we have been in, uh, observing in recent 
years from failed referenda to the euro crisis, refugee crisis, Brexit, all seem to reflect this particular tension between an efficiency uh, driven functional logic of integration that is at you know, cross purpose with an identity driven uh, community logic uh, of um, uh, integration that drives towards a uh, small scale. Now, the main uh, thesis of the paper is that this time is different. The corona crisis is different. It turned the post functionalist trade off upside down because there was a functional demand for downscaling to the national level and sometimes the subnational level in the name of security. And uh, at the same time, there were political demands for upscaling to the European level for reasons of solidarity. So as Ursula von der Leyen put it during the first uh, European summit, uh, during the crisis in, in early March, we are all Italians. So uh, there was a lot of talk about um, uh, solidarity. And, you know, these, um, uh, uh, the, the policy consequences of functional downscaling and political upscaling were a rebordering of Schengen and the single market, which uh, had been have been rigidly closed in, in March and April and are still only partly open today. And at the same time, a counter movement uh, towards a debordering of fiscal risk and burden sharing. So Ursula von der Leyen claimed already in, in April uh, that Europe had done more in the first four weeks of this crisis than it did in the four years of the last one, referring to the Eurozone crisis. And there's a certain uh, truth to that. Now, what is constant is, of course, this um, uh, uh, sense of drama and, and uh, 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 failure. The EU loses regulatory control of its greatest asset, namely border-free movement. Uh, and it's measured against its greatest weakness, cross-border fiscal uh, sharing. And um, yes, so I, I think that's, that's uh, the situation. And um, what the paper tries to do is to make sense of this set situation or, you know, this development. And I developed the argument in three steps. First, I talk about the rebordering uh, of the market. First, in terms of theory, I talk about efficiency and security as two determinants of functional scale. And then uh, tell the story about mm, the rebordering of Schengen and the single market in terms of a um, tension between uh, efficiency and security, security concerns, overwhelming efficiency considerations. The second uh, part is on uh, debordering solidarity. I talk about identity and empathy as, as two determinants of solidarity of political community, and then reconstruct the debordering of fiscal solidarity during uh, the corona crisis, and I close with three um, uh, implications of our findings for the post functional theory of integration. Now, rebordering the market. There are two stories about a functional scale, the functional scale of governance. One is an efficiency story, and this is the official post functionalist story. And in this story, efficiency stands for the benefits of debordering, the benefits of eliminating borders uh, between governance units in order to create a large functional scale that uh, unlocks collective gains from trade, economies of scale, uh, risk pooling, learning, competition, etc. 
And this um, efficiency logic of large scale and the debordering that uh, requires um, was the, the operating ideology of the single market, Schengen and uh, monetary union in the 1990s. All these um, integration uh, projects were about unlocking uh, growth, increasing efficiency, um, creating innovation jobs, etc. But there's a, a second story about functional scale, and that's the story that we know from realist theories in IR, and it's a security story. And in this security uh, story, um, uh, functional scale stands for the benefits of borders, because borders provide protection from external uh, threats, attacks, sudden stops, supply chain disruptions, crime, disease. And they also protect against the dissipation of scarce internal resources. So um, this security story about um, 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 uh, functional scale highlights the advantages of smallness, the advantages of uh, boundedness. And this was the operating ideology, for instance, of the uh, common agricultural policy of the 1960s, which was very much about food security, you know, keeping external borders up, lowering internal borders, and uh, instituting high intervention prices in order to incentivize um, domestic uh, production. Now, what we would expect is that this efficiency security trade-off in the determination of functional scale is context uh, and time dependent. It depends on circumstances where whether security or efficiency will be the main determinant of functional scale. And what we can say is that, you, are, you know, until recently, efficiency was a very strong argument for large functional scale, but during um, uh, the corona crisis, it had, has been completely swamped by security uh, arguments. And the story really starts in uh, January uh, 2020 with mounting security threats. So in mid-January, there were the first confirmed COVID deaths in China. In end of January, there were the first confirmed cases in Europe, in France, Germany, and Italy. Uh, in late February, there was the first regional lockdown in Northern Italy. In early March, uh, the Czech Republic, Germany, France, and Poland introduced export bans for medical supplies. Uh, mostly personal protective equipment, thereby cutting off the rest of the EU from um, uh, the most important uh, intra-EU sources uh, of supply. And a couple of days later, Austria closed its land border to Italy. So, you know, these are somewhat arbitrary markers of how the security threat increased uh, over time. And at the same time, you know, efficiency uh, was on the retreat as an argument in mid February, the EU Health uh, Council still said this um, pandemic was no reason to put an end to free movement within the EU. The EU Commission uh, uh, saw no scenario for Schengen suspension the ECB warned uh, against overreacting uh, to the crisis and it's still at 11th of March, just a few days before Germany closed its land borders, Angela Merkel said that border closures were not an adequate means to, uh, to stop uh, the virus. And in March, you know, security concerns reigned uh, supreme. 
So I have a figure here which uh, gives you a country by country timeline when certain um, border restrictions were introduced, export bans for medical uh, equipment, entry bans uh, for foreigners and temporary uh, border controls. And what you can see is that most member states introduced all of these measures and what you can also see is that most measures were decided on the weekend of the 14th and 15th of March. On the 14th and 15th of March, there was this decision to close down countries in the week 16th to uh, 23rd March. There, were, uh, there are member states missing from the list like Malta. So there weren't any uh, illegal restrictions to entering Malta. Malta simply cut all uh, transport connections to, um, to the European mainland. Uh, legally, you could go there. In fact, you couldn't. So in fact, you know, by the end of March, uh, free movement in the EU uh, came uh, to a sudden uh, uh, stop. Um, the member states re-emerged as security providers of last uh, resort. They assumed national control of border closures, so they didn't ask the EU uh, for permission, but, uh, you know, they closed borders uh, proactively and partly at very high uh, efficiency costs, which could be observed simply by measuring how many kilometers lorries were, were um, queuing up at border crossing points, for instance, from Germany uh, to Poland. The EU lost regulatory control of free movements. So the member states disregarded EU rules and regulations uh, when imposing um, uh, border restrictions. As I said, they didn't ask and they didn't read uh, the rule books very carefully. The commission was completely sidelined. It tried to promote the EU as the superior security unit. So more fortress Europe and less fortress uh, nation state, but uh, the overall success uh, was limited. So the commission tried to mitigate internal border closures between member states through persuasion. So there were a lot of, there was a lot of soft law on how to coordinate um, uh, controls at, at internal borders. And there was some litigation, some infringement procedures against um, um, uh, the border restrictions of individual member states. But Basically, uh, none of that uh, went very far. And there was an attempt to coordinate uh, the common closure of the external border through common uh, rules on export restriction, common rules on uh, entry bans for foreign travelers, and uh, common rules for foreign uh, investment. Uh, 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 a screening. But, you know, as could, can also be observed during the second wave now that the member states are very much in control. So if Hungary decides to close, uh, uh, to impose an entry ban, it, it simply does so. Hungary is green, all other countries are red now. This is how the government announced its um, new uh, entry ban. But of course, this is only half of, of the uh, story of what happened to borders in, in Europe during uh, the Corona crisis. The other half of the story is about uh, the debordering of solidarity, increased fiscal sharing between uh, the member states. Now community in, in the post-functionalist uh, canon is, is defined as sharing in common. <coughs> so as material solidarity. And again, there are two stories. 
where solidarity comes from. And one story, the post-functional story, is an identity story. And here the assumption is that people have sympathy with their own kind, with people who share a common language, a common culture, a common institutional framework, common tacit understandings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And they are prepared to share with uh, uh, their own kind, with you know the members of uh, their in-group, simply because they're like them. They share with people who are like them, but they don't share with people who are not like them who are uh, outsiders. So there are separate accounts for the in-group and um, uh, the out-group. And this was you know, the operating ideology be behind the principle of juste retour in, in the EU budget and uh, of the no bailout rule of the Maastricht Treaty. The no bailout rule basically prohibits fiscal solidarity in, um, uh, uh, among the member states of, of monetary uh, union. Now, the second story is a story from social psychology, and um, that's a story of empathy. Now, empathy is a very loose term, and, uh, you know, social psychologists have uh, written poems about how um, loose this concept is. What I mean is what, you know, Paul Bloom has called rational compassion, you know, which is caring, disciplined by cost benefit analysis. Y you help others not because they're like you, because, but because you sense there's a common vulnerability you could be in their position and their bad position may have bad repercussions um, for yourself. And this rational compassion, this empathy can uh, motivate sharing with deserving outsiders. And this was uh, the operating ideology behind the Schumann Declaration. So when Schumann um, uh, proposed uh, the coal and steel community, he didn't do so because he thought, you know, Germany and France were practically one and shared a common uh, identity. No, 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 no. His emphasis was on an age old enmity between the two, an age old opposition that had to be overcome in the common interest. There was no peace for each of these countries individually. And therefore, they, they had um, uh, 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 to align. So it was not common identity, but it was, you know, you could call it rational compassion, which drove this uh, proposal, this declaration. And, you know, something like empathy is also reflected in the own uh, resources of the EU budget or in the European Social Fund, which, for instance, in the 1960s um, funded, spent 80% of its budget on uh, retraining on Southern Italy alone. You know, a very unequal, uneven distribution of funds out of the understanding that Southern Italy needed more help um, than um, the rest of the community. Now, the short of it is we assume that identity and empathy uh, both matter as determinants of solidarity, but uh, uh, the balance in which they matter is, again, context and uh, time uh, dependent. And during the Eurozone crisis, you know, identity uh, and identity politics seem to reign supreme and, and um, uh, the corona crisis brought back a large dose of empathy which facilitated a, a boost in uh, fiscal uh, sharing. In um, a recent survey, 
that Anton and I and uh, Lorenzo and Mohammed did with uh, uh, YouGov, we had this question, now imagine another country in the European Union is suffering from a particular type of crisis. Do you think your country should or should not provide any uh, major help? And we had eight types of crisis ranging from natural disaster to debt. And uh, what you can see in natural disaster is a no brainer. Uh, basically all um, respondents agree that a country suffering from natural disaster deserves help. Uh, don't knows are very low, opposition is uh, very low. On the other end of the scale is uh, a debt crisis. Uh, here, uh, only a large minority thinks that um, uh, help is uh, uh, adequate. A relative majority opposes uh, this measure, and uh, you know there are uh, quite a, a, a few don't know. Now, during the Eurozone crisis, the issue of uh, fiscal uh, solidarity was only um, um, framed in terms of debt, who pays the debt of Greece or, or whoever. And this, this was negotiated in identity terms and didn't get very far. Uh, during, the Euro, uh, during the Corona crisis, this issue of debt fused with the issue of disease. And, and this fusion of debt and disease allowed for solidarity uh, to develop to an extent that was impossible to develop during um, uh, 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 the Eurozone crisis. You know, just a little vignette. In, in 2017, the then uh, Dutch uh, Minister of uh, Finance, Jerome Dijsselbroem, uh, blamed uh, the Southern Rim countries for having wasted their money on drink and women and now expecting the North to bail them out. And how unfair is that? And of course, you know, there was an out, outcry, but, you know, Dijsselbloem never came even close to apologizing. Uh, during the Corona crisis, Dijsselbloem's successor, Hoekstra, he, um, uh, 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 he talked, you know, about the risks of moral hazard and how the corona crisis could be abused to upload um, um, uh, 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 fiscal legacies uh, of the South on, uh, you know, hardworking Northerners. And, you know, it sounded very technical and, you know, like an argument, but, you know, in this case, he was forced to uh, apologize and apologize um, immediately. So the short of it is um, the supply of empathy was higher during the uh, Corona crisis, and this created uh, expectations of um, uh, uh, fiscal solidarity and led to an outpouring of proposals and uh, decisions for uh, fiscal uh, schemes for fiscal risk and burden sharing. And, you know, just, just look at the headline figures. There was a, uh, there was a competition for uh, huge figures. So um, uh, this is still the same uh, European Union that in February couldn't agree on how to uh, fill the uh, gap of 10 to 12 billion annually left by uh, Brexit. And now, you know, it's about 120 billion, 750 billion, 200 billion, or now the uh, recovery fund uh, that was uh, eventually agreed in July, seven, uh, 700 billion overall, of which 390 billion in uh, grants. Now you could argue, of course, there were the frugal force and um, 
they uh, achieved a reduction in um, the volume of the grants, and this is all true, but uh, still, uh, for the first time in its history, the EU has decided to run a quasi-federal deficit for, for reasons of macroeconomic stabilization. You know, and, and this is quite something and could potentially have long-lasting effects. After all, you know, these debts have to be paid back uh, uh, until 2058. That's a fairly long time that um, the member states have uh, uh, a common uh, concern, you know, as the now much in vogue Alexander Hamilton uh, on once uh, 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 observed, uh, a common debt will be a strong salmon for our nation. And, um, you know, this could happen um, in uh, Europe as well. So um, uh, what's uh, the state of play? So the, there was general agreement for the need uh, uh, for uh, solidarity. So while in um, 2010, during uh, the Eurozone crisis, the talk in Germany was all about saving the Europe. Nobody said we are all Greeks now. It was all uh, saving uh, the euro from Greeks' faults, whereas now it's about Germany uh, showing uh, solidarity. The switch to empathy, to solidarity, undermined uh, the North, the frugal force, politically and rhetorically, and led uh, to the fast production of joint programs with large headline uh, figures. So while the um, nation state re-emerged as the security provider of last resort, the EU uh, suddenly assumed the role of solidarity provider of last resort, a, a kind of reinsurance unit for a, a, its member states. Uh, so the ECB was much more active than during the Eurozone crisis. The commission came out fairly strong. There is a new centrality of the EU budget, which had been marginalized since uh, the British um, budgetary uh, compromise in 1984. And there are no uh, de novo bodies. So during the uh, Eurozone crisis, everything was um, uh, uh, done through new special purpose vehicles like the EMS, for uh, instance, uh, the, the, the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism. Uh, but now it's all operated through the central uh, EU uh, institutions. Now, uh, what can we learn from this uh, story about post-functionalism. Well, I, I think we can learn three things, may, maybe actually four things. The first thing is that the post-functionalist story about the two logics makes sense. There are two logics, a logic of community or a logic of solidarity and a functional logic. And these logics often work at cross purposes also in the corona crisis. But, um, you know, there, there are also um, additions to what uh, post-functionalism has to offer. Let me focus on the post first, the logic of uh, community. And this logic is not just driven by uh, identity concerns pushing towards a um, uh, smaller scope, but can also be driven by empathy concerns if the right triggers are pulled. The scope of community would, we would argue, is not uh, uh, only or not mainly defined by identity, but it can also be defined by issues. You know, if, if the dominant issue is debt, 
then you have another scope of community than if the dominant issue is disease. On the functional in um, post-functionalism, the functional scale depends uh, not only on efficiency, which is pushing towards large scale, but also uh, uh, on security, which may be pushing towards um, uh, smaller scales. And again, this efficiency security balance is uh, time and context uh, dependent. Final observation on the balance between the post and the functional, the functional logic and the logic of community. You know, that varies very strongly by policy sector. Uh, the market borders, the borders in Schengen and the single market were dominated by the functional logic, either of the efficiency type or of the security type. Solidarity issues were raised, but they were completely secondary. Uh, what drove the rebordering during um, uh, the corona crisis was the functional logic of security. Whereas fiscal borders are uh, dominated by the logic of community. Both the bordering of you know, or the prevention of um, uh, fiscal solidarity in Maastricht was driven by identity, the debordering of, of fiscal sharing during the um, uh, uh, corona crisis was driven by, by empathy. But, uh, you know, it, it was this feelings, this, this um, um, uh, uh, support for, for sharing that drove the story and not functional uh, considerations. Um, so our, our intuition here is that, you know, when it comes to the integration of rules, this tend to raise functional issues of efficiency and security. Whereas when it comes to the integration of resources, this tends to uh, raise issues of identity and um, uh, empathy and, you know, this may have implications, but that needs uh, further research. And on this uh, happy note, I thank you for your uh, attention and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Philip, for this brilliant uh, talk. I open now the floor for uh, questions and comments. Uh, thanks, Philip, for this really interesting talk. Um, so I wondered about your characterization of the you know, Greece bailouts as more solidarity focused when they were also creditor bailouts, right? I mean, the, the, the decision to bail out Greece also meant that the German lenders got repaid. Um, so I wonder what that does to your distinction between sort of more, um, you know, solidarity infused collective decision making versus um, more you know sort of more isolated ones uh yes that's that's a good point actually um i i think um you know the the structure of the problem of uh, both crises was in certain uh, respects very similar it was about you know uh, creating a fiscal backup for fiscally exposed member states of um, uh, uh, monetary union. And in a way, it happened in both cases. So also during um, um, the Eurozone crisis, there were, um, uh, 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 there were activities to, to, to beef up Greece and, and the other um, crisis states. Uh, what is important uh, to observe is that, A, it always took very long for um, uh, this help to materialize. You know, as I cited uh, Ursula von der Leyen, um, the EU did more in four weeks of the uh, uh, corona crisis than it did in four years of uh, the Eurozone crisis. And in the end, what the 
member states did collectively uh, was never enough. So in the end, it was, was really the ECB um, um, uh, 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 that saved the day and something like uh, this uh, next generation recovery fund uh, was not forthcoming. You could, of course, argue this has nothing to do with um, solidarity or larger supply of solidarity to, uh, during the last crisis compared to the former crisis. You could also say this is perhaps um, uh, the effect of, of uh, collective learning. You know, it needed uh, the failure of, or the complications of the Eurozone crisis in order to learn that you had to be quicker in, in providing fiscal insurance to exposed uh, uh, member states. Thank you. We have a question from um, the audience here. Bridget, the camera will turn. Hi, Philip. Thank you very much for, for a great paper. I wonder if, if you could think a little about the interaction and intersection between these two logics, the identity and the functional, because one could argue that in March, Italy, when it triggered the uh, civilian support framework and Europe went silent and got no response, which has never happened in the history of integration before, Italy played the identity solidarity card very strongly. But in order to move that to the EU as the provider of security of last resort, then you also have to look at the preferences of other member states. So Macron, France had been arguing for and waiting for an opportunity to strengthen uh, the fiscal side of the euro. So Macron saw his opportunity and it was not identity driven, but functionally. I mean, he made the argument time and time again about the vulnerability of the euro area. And he managed to get a sufficient number of countries to agree with him, the famous nine, the letter. And in a way that then it was up to Berlin to either ignore that or respond to that. But also Berlin was not just concerned about showing solidarity, but was also clearly concerned equally in this crisis about the long-term sustainability of the Euro area, i.e. Italy too big to bail, too big to fail. So I'm just wondering if you would reflect a little on the interaction and intersection between the two logics. Um, yes. Uh... You know, I, I, I think the, the most momentous change was the change in the German position. The French had been pushing for a stronger fiscal backup to monetary union uh, all the time. And, but Germany had, had always blocked that. And then in April, it defected. It started to defect on its uh, erstwhile um, um, coalition partners uh, of the frugal uh, 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 force. So why did it do that? And, uh, you know, as I try to uh, um, um, define empathy, it's, it's, it's rational compassion. You know, it's not just free floating uh, emotionality, but you know, there's a reasoning behind. And you could, of course, argue um, that the Italian market was more important uh, to, to Germany uh, than the Greek market during uh, the Eurozone uh, crisis. And, and uh, therefore, this, this common vulnerability was felt much more in, intensely, uh, uh, perhaps also in economic terms in Germany um, uh, 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 during the crisis. And it's interesting to observe that, for instance, the German Association of Industry had a joint paper with uh, their counterparts in France and, and Italy, where they asked for, for um, uh, for material solidarity with Italy in order to, to preserve 
not just the coherence of um, uh, the Eurozone, but to make sure that an important export market remained um, uh, 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 viable. On this um, Italy asking for European support in, in um, March, um, yeah, that of course was perceived as um, a failure of uh, a solidarity in Italy and was polit tried to be politicized as such by, uh, by uh, the Lega, um, which, which is an interesting move because suddenly the Lega asked for European uh, 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 solidarity and declared itself um, uh, disappointed that this uh, solidarity was not uh, forthcoming. Um, I mean, if you now look at, at the second wave, uh, I think there has been some learning because now the sharing of material is, um, is uh, much more developed than during uh, the early weeks of, of um, the first wave. Now, I'm not sure this really answered your question to, to the interaction of the two logics. You know, what I found striking was that there was so little interaction because the logic, this functional logic, this tension between security and efficiency really played out only when it came to, um, uh, to the physical borders, you know, in Schengen and uh, the market. Uh, whereas these solidarity issues really came to the fore only um, in, in uh, 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 relation to these issues of uh, uh, fiscal sharing. Um, we have a follow-up comment by Anya Thomas. Yeah, thank you very much. It's uh, it's actually a follow up question or comment on uh, on what Bridget said about the two logics because I think for the, there is this alternative na narrative that you could have. I mean, your narrative is it's ideas. I mean, it's this identity or empathy uh, question, but there is this alternative narrative which is that, for example, or in particular for the German position, we have a completely different domestic context because. During the Eurozone crisis, we had um, a coalition with the Liberal Party. So Merkel was in a coalition with the Liberal Party, which was strongly opposed to any, uh, to any transfer, any common budget, any integration uh, as far as macroeconomic coordination. And now we are in the situation where we have a grand coalition with Social Democrats, which are much more uh, in favor, at least on paper, at least that's what they said in their 2008, nine, I don't remember, uh, coalition contract, uh, which was negotiated and then never implemented. So I think there is also something very fundamentally different for Germany in this crisis. And also in, uh, in the European Council, there's something fundamentally different for Germany. That's the fact that the UK is, is not there anymore and Germany cannot hide behind the UK, which it liked to do sometimes. Thank you. Uh, uh, yes, uh, you know, I definitely agree uh, that uh, Brexit facilitated uh, solidarity in this case. And it, you know, the, the counterfactual with Britain still in would be a very difficult one to decide, but, but very interesting. On, on uh, the domestic politics of, of uh, uh, Germany, you're right, of course, that the party political um, complexion of the government was different. But in, in this survey that I mentioned, the YouGov survey, we, uh, we also broke down answers to these questions, when would you give solidarity by, by party support? And you know, the strange thing is when it comes to debt, you don't see much difference between the social democrats and the uh, conservatives. They are completely at a level. Uh, the Linke is also uh, at the level of the CDU and the SPD. Only the Greens 
um, are in support of fiscal solidarity. And the FDP, the liberals are of course slightly more skeptical than the social democrats, but really not that much. Um, so it, yeah, the, the party political um, uh, differences may have played less of a role in this case than you might have thought or hoped for that matter. Hans-Peter. May I come in? I, I, I think it's a brilliant scheme in your paper, but uh, I, I, I try to, to, to put it into somewhat different terms. Uh, you famously, with Jachten Fuchs, you distinguish between uh, core state powers and, and uh, economic policy. And in this case, you have the common market or e efficiency versus security. And security is, of course, a core state power or related to core state powers, as is fiscal policy. So you, you say that if, I, I would say, if core state powers are concerned, then scope is much less, uh, enlarging the scope is much less attractive than if the economy and the economic policy is concerned. So that would, that would uh, assimilate the Eurozone crisis to the COVID crisis. In both crises, core state powers were concerned and in that uh, sense, in both crises, uh, uh, rebordering or lack of solidarity would have been called for. And to a certain extent, it also was, I think, in, in, to a certain extent, uh, fiscal, in the case of Eurozone, uh, fiscal uh, solidarity was not forthcoming. Uh, it is now forthcoming, but before it has not been forthcoming. Now, uh, uh, but that, that leads me to the second dimension, namely the distinction between identity and empathy and, and why in the one case identity and in the other case empathy. I, I think what is very important in this respect is that in the one case you had asymmetry in uh, the problem structure and in the other case you had symmetry. So in the Eurozone, they were not the same. They, the, the different member states were differently hit by the crisis. You could argue that in the COVID crisis, they were all hit more or less. I mean, some were more hit than others, but everybody was hit in similar ways. And that increased what you call empathy. But uh, I would then argue with the problem structure. The problem structure was in both uh, cases somewhat different. In the Eurozone crisis, it was asymmetric. In the uh, COVID crisis, it was symmetric, which then had different reasons, uh, gave different cause for the motives uh, to cooperate or not to cooperate. So I just wonder what you think about this slightly different conceptualization of your two dimensions. Yes. So uh, let me start with your second point on symmetry and asymmetry. Of course, and the policymakers in March and April were eager to highlight symmetry. But in fact, uh, during these months, the situation was very asymmetric both in terms of infection numbers, in terms of caseload, and in um, terms of, uh, of uh, fiscal threats. It's only now during the second wave uh, where countries that were spared during the first wave like Austria are, are fairly hard hit that this feeling of symmetry 
really diffuses. And uh, I think you're right. This facilitates empathy. This facilitates a feeling of uh, um, um, rational compassion. It makes it easier to put oneself into uh, other people's shoes. And in, in uh, this um, uh, uh, in this way, of course, the symmetry facilitates empathy, facilitates um, uh, solidarity. But you know, I would still argue that that it makes a difference whether the underlying problem is debt or disease. You know, if you have an asymmetric disease crisis. You know, I would still assume that solidarity is much more forthcoming than if you have an asymmetric uh, uh, debt crisis. On core state powers and, and um, regulation, you know, I, I, I think you are right, of course. You know, we, in our earlier writings, we also, uh, not so very explicitly, but implicitly tied core state powers to issues of identity and, and, and uh, regulation to issues of efficiency. And therefore, for us, it was also a bit of a surprise that during the Corona crisis, you know, these resources, the core state powers, the fiscal was apparently easier to deborder than the regulation. Now you can say, of course, security is really also about core state powers. I'm, I'm not so sure because I would like to, to define core state powers in terms of resources, not in terms of you know, policy goals or, or, or uh, uh, policy fields. But you know, the important point, as you said, um, if, it, if integration concerns core state powers, it's less attractive to enlarge. And I think that is true. And that was very obvious during the Eurozone crisis. What we found so striking during the Corona crisis was that it was apparently easier to deborder resources, to deborder core state powers than to uh, uh, deborder the market. And this was what uh, struck us. But um, you're right, this connection to core state powers, it's there implicitly, but we should be better at bringing that out, yes. Can I jump in? Sure. Yes, please, Calypso Nicolaides. Um, yes, I just uh, thanks for a great paper and really stimulating. And I, in, in fact, I wanted to really follow on Hans Peter um, because I mean the spirit of, of your presentation is to say that um, um, it turns post functionalism on its head, and um, and the way in which you recover post functionalism is to say, ah, huh, we're going to make it more subtle by saying, you know, under what condition, and it depends. Um, and it depends because now we're balancing the functional logic with security and we're balancing the identity logic with solidarity. Um, but then the question for me is to what extent um, this, this situation, the, the COVID and the current crisis leads us to kind of re-question some of the original assumptions of post-functionalism itself. I mean, which you may say that's what you're doing with, with this paper, but not exactly. So, I mean, and on two fronts. One is uh, you know, the debate on functionalism leading to a bigger scale, because here you tell us that the COVID uh, drive for smaller scale is due to security concerns. But why wouldn't you frame it in terms of functional concerns that this is the big debate? You know, um, aren't cities or neighborhood better at dealing with, with a disease, with a virus, with a pandemic? Um, at least in some, under some conditions. Um, you know, I would invoke 
Alstrom and, and you know, decentered governance and all of that, right? So why aren't we revisiting that aspect of functionalism? And then the second part of it is you're bringing in, you know, security balancing uh, as a downward imperative, but at the same time, you were just talking about debordering core power. And of course, you know, there's been a hardcore security argument for that. Um, I think that more than ever, uh, European heads of states are moved by geopolitical concerns. You know, the embeddedness of this crisis in a world of increased, you know, rivalry and competition, whether it's symbolic rivalry or hard rivalry in terms of health and beyond and AI and health and, and all of these things. So the security imperative for economies of scale is become much bigger than during the Euro crisis. Um, I mean, for scaling up. And so security pulls us, you know, in the other direction than what you do with your balancing. So just kind of two points to ask if this doesn't lead us to revisit a bit deep, more deeply and even more deeply, because you do revisit it deeply, but you know, the post-functionalist assumption. Uh, yes, uh, thank you uh, very much. A actually, I think what, what you say, um, extends what what we uh, uh, try to do. So in terms of function, I think you're right. Uh, we don't make the claim that uh, the nation state is the optimal security unit in um, times of a pandemic. It may very well be that the optical, uh, optimal unit is even smaller than that and has regional or, or sub-regional uh, boundaries. And it's interesting to observe that in many states, you also have domestic uh, mobility restrictions. So in Germany, you can't simply move between regions. And now I hear in Italy right now, um, inter-regional travel is, uh, also uh, restricted. I mean, the advantage of, of, of um, the nation state in March was really that it had the logistics for border closure in place. You know, it could act extremely fast. So it was not only a question of scale, it was also a question of time horizon. You know, if, if, if uh, you have the feeling that um, uh, your survival is threatened now, you know, that, uh, that suggests a different um, uh, 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 solution and a different choice of scale than if you uh, think, and this leads me to your second observation, you know, the geopolitical situation is eroding and in the long term, we have to get our um, uh, act together. Then of course, you can think much more in terms of efficiency, economies of scale and security, provision, armaments, production, um, et cetera. Um, but, um, <coughs> On, on your second point, <laughs> I mean, that's a very classical argument in, in federalism studies. You know, Riker, for instance, said that the EU cannot be a federation, a state, unless it doesn't have a common enemy. And without the war, it will not turn into, uh, you know, a true federation and behind this is of course that without the security threat both the external bordering towards the outside world so this inclusion exclusion thing and the joint mobilization of resources resources that are also anchors of national identity national self-government and all that will simply not happen You don't look very convinced. So, uh, you have to unmute yourself. I mean, I hear you about the, the, the classic argument, but I mean, do we have to go that far? I think that 
um, I mean, here our, 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 our issue is the extent to which common health policies in particular and the fiscal um, corollary to that can be framed in terms of uh, the party, the security argument, which you yourself in, in, in the paper invoke as a downward uh, force. And all I'm trying to say is security actually these days is a kind of a, a bigger thing. I mean, for instance, uh, you know, um, uh, reshoring, um, controlling AI, controlling platforms, uh, um, apps, um, tracing apps. I mean, all of these things that is the high tech end of what uh, and, and some of the resources that the EU will be using, you know, are framed, I think, in the in, as security challenges for our leaders as as existing as a whole in a you know, in a world where the pandemic will change, you know, these rivalries. And um, so I'm, I'm not necessarily, you know, going all the way to the traditional uh, security. No. Thing. Security arguments have led to upscaling. At least they're, they're part of the, the upscaling push, not just the downscaling. That okay, no, no, uh, yeah, you're right, of course. And this, uh, this has been the rhetoric of the commission throughout the crisis. The commission throughout the crisis has tried to convince the member states that the EU is um, uh, 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 the more efficient security uh, a unit for security provision. And all its papers it uh, published in uh, April on you know, both uh, controlling FDI, as you mentioned, or, you know, the coordination of tracing apps was all about, you know, gaining security um, uh, benefits by, by somehow coordinating and, and uh, joining forces. The point is that in all issues having to do with security, including the tracing app, the nation states, the member states still uh, assert final control. The tracing apps are national things. You go to another member state and your tracing app doesn't work anymore. And, uh, you know, it's not obvious to me, even during the second wave, that the member states let go of that. Um, I should jump in and apologize. Uh, I did not see the blue hands uh, on my screen. I see them now, and I will uh, go through them in order. So, Dorote Bole, Bruno De Vite, Lucas Schramm, Adrien Heritier, Carlos Claus, and Paolo Chiocchetti. I don't know if we have time for, we might have time if we uh, keep it um, yeah. concise. So, uh, Dorote, please. Um. Thank you very much. I, this, this is a fascinating paper and talk. So I, I think my comments will um, probably, they go in the similar direction as many other comments. So for me, there is a tension on the one hand dealing with functionalism, something which is kind of in seemingly objectively given uh, and the, you can make, um, make hypotheses on what is functional and what is not functional. And the explanations that you get for the different, which seems to be much more strategic interaction, policy learning, we haven't talked about that, but I think a part, a big part of the story might also how we came out of the previous crisis has also informed strategies um, to the current crisis and also um, uh, basically different contexts, so Brexit and so on. And I am just not, so, if this is a story about functionalism and 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 you know or post let's say post functionalism, I still miss a theory uh, a theoretical argument. What is the Corona crisis a crisis of? So why would we? I mean, you have bits and pieces, but then you have to go all the way down. Why would the Corona crisis be so incredibly different? than the, um, uh, uh, let's say the Euro crisis. And your argument was basically debt and disease. But debt, so my, 
the counter hypothesis would be it really depends on how strategic actors frame this damn crisis. You could have framed the debt crisis in a very similar way of solidarity, and you can frame disease as something super ugly, and you don't want to have anything to do with this, and you put all these people into a ghetto and basically let them starve. And we see this also, right? In in so so to put it short, is it really about kind of objective uh, stuff of this uh, this crisis? And if so, which are they? What is corona crisis a case of? Or is it a way of how actors strategically frame certain crises and try to get legitimacy in this way then also um, the, this, this relationship between identity and um, uh, and 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 um, efficiency is being uh, constructed. Thanks. Do we collect, or do I answer that now? Um, um, if you can keep it uh, short, you are welcome to answer now. Well, uh, you know, is the crisis objective, or is it socially? Constructed, I would say, of course, it's socially constructed, and uh, a lot depends on on the right framing of, of the crisis, as you can see, especially uh, in Germany. But having said that, it, it uh, I would argue that reality is some um, how shall I say that resilient. It's not so easy to put tell just any story or to put just any frame on any crisis. And if you have a disease crisis, you know, you have different options for framing than if you have a debt crisis. Having said that, I don't um, uh, deny that all the factors you mentioned, you know, historical sequence, learning, uh, Brexit, etc., that all this has um, uh, plausibly influenced uh, the outcome of uh, the crisis. We just tried to focus on the uh, post-functionalist uh, variables here in our explanation. Bruno De Vitte. Yes, uh, thank you, Philip, for this um, interesting macro view of what's going on in the European Union. It's also always very useful to to get to think about it in those you know broad terms my question is about the use of solidarity as the sort of overall denominator of uh, what's going on now with these uh, the recovery fund and the other uh, financial programs to what extent can we call this solidarity if there is no cost involved for any of the member states uh, in the short term there's no costs because the money is either created by the European Central Bank or is going to be borrowed by the European Commission on the markets. So there's no national member state money involved. In the midterm or long term, all the member states expect a benefit, actually, an economic benefit from these programs. For a number of reasons, some of them have been mentioned, for example, the fact that it's in the interest of every member state that all the economies of the EU you know, get through the crisis so that Italy and Spain and the other countries do not sink. That's in the interest also of Germany and the Netherlands and so on. So if there is no cost involved for any of the member states, can we really use the term solidarity to describe what's going on? Uh, this, this is a, a tricky uh, question. Uh, it's a good one. And um, first, of all, um, there are no costs involved, but in the same way, no costs of that type were involved during the Eurozone crisis. And still, you know, the level of fiscal risk and burden sharing uh, was lower and took uh, longer uh, to uh, develop. And you could say the gap between the two is explained by something you could call um, uh, solidarity. And of course, you're also right, in the long term, this may be a benefit uh, uh, for all, but then uh, there are, of course, time inconsistency uh, 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 problems. Just because something is a long-term benefit uh, does not mean that there cannot be any short-term benefits from uh, 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 defection. And therefore, the, the 
problem is politically less innocent uh, than you make it appear, I'm afraid. Sorry, uh, at hand, please. Philippe, thanks a lot for your talk. I have a question which links up actually well with Bruno's question. What do you think, uh, what does this common concern as you described it until 2058 uh, in fiscal sharing of uh, burdens, what difference will it make? What will it change in the institutional structure of the European polity to have this kind of new object member states will focus on how do individual member states deal with the, the debts they take up and use it for particular purposes in their domestic policies? Um, thank you. Yeah, what, what will be the changes in the institutional structure? Hmm. Hard to tell. Um, one thing is there will be one more um, uh, benefit of the euro, and this is the creation of a new um, uh, class of safe assets, which seems to be very popular in capital markets and thereby can solidify um, the position of uh, the euro internationally and therefore also um, within the monetary uh, union. A second um, institutional implication may be for, for the system of own resources, you know, how the EU um, uh, budget is funded. I'm sure there must be more institutional implications. Unfortunately, I can't think of any right now, but um, you know, we should have lunch over that one day. Carlos Closa. So, thank you very much, Philip. Um, great paper. I enjoyed it. Uh, and I'm going to, to uh, press you with a question that perhaps uh, um, it's for, uh, for an intuition. And it's the following uh, What is the theoretical uh, assumption that you make to, to set the limit for the scale at the national level? why not to include also the regional level? And this crisis has uh, shown empirically some cases that regions have played a significant role in terms of identity and even solidarity, even if for the construction of uh, political discourses. This is the case of Spain. We have seen a lot of fight between the central level and the regional level with discourses about uh, solidarity, discourses about uh, security, and an increase in the tensions between regions, something which is not uh, common. So does this transform somehow your, uh, your construction to include a third level of uh, governance in the scheme? Thank you. Well, in a way, I, I already dealt with this a bit um, when I tried to answer to Calypso. No, there was no presumption in, or there is no presumption that somehow the nation state is the optimal uh, level of security provision. There are indeed arguments for subnational uh, security unions when it comes to, um, uh, to the pandemic. I think one reason why the nation state um, emerged uh, so forcefully as a security provider was that it had all the logistics, all the resources, all the machinery in place. So it's simply much easier to stop traffic at um, international borders than to stop traffic or regulate um, uh, uh, movement at subnational borders. And I think this is something that made a difference, especially given the high um, uh, time pressure um, that prevailed in, in March and April. Paolo Chiochetti. 
Well, thank you for the interest presentation. I wanted to ask you a question about uh, uh, your survey item. So your question about solidarity in the different cases. If you can see from the data, uh, any differentiation in this kind of solidarity, particularly, for example, between Eurozone and non-Eurozone countries or Schengen and non-Schengen countries? Um, no, actually, no. Um, what you see for some of the items is um, that solidarity depends on whether respondents expect their country to be a net ben uh, beneficiary or net payer. But importantly, that does not hold for all items. It's particularly prevalent, uh, prevalent when it comes to debt. And you also see um, that uh, uh, um, uh, solidarity um, um, erodes with geographical distance. You know, solidarity is easier with your neighbors than um, with, uh, with more distant um, uh, countries. What you also see in the survey is that there's an anti-Brexit effect. So nobody wants to be solidaristic with the UK. So the UK is really punished. Uh, respondents uh, are rather solidaristic with Tanzania or, or Vietnam than with the UK. And the UK in turn um, prefers uh, to be solidaristic with uh, Cyprus and Malta, which you know makes intuitive sense, but um, uh, was interesting um, to observe. But membership in Schengen, membership in the Eurozone, no, we didn't see any clear effect of that. Okay, thank you. Um, did I miss anyone? I don't think so. No more hands, no more. Can I maybe... Uh, uh, ask a quick question about the debordering, um, the fiscal uh, solidarity, the fiscal uh, sharing. I found your talk really very uh, stimulating. And uh, you say that this uh, uh, debordering under conditions of COVID uh, is a story of politicization. And um, yes, you say that this is a matter of uh, identity and of uh, uh, empathy, it's an uh, identity empathy story of, uh, of integration. But uh, I am not entirely sure how this counts as politicization. Um, and therefore, uh, can we really speak of politicization in, 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 in this case? Uh, um, or is it not precisely the opposite? I mean, there is no choice, there is nothing to uh, argue about. I mean, a lot of the literature about um, the welfare state would actually argue that uh, elements of solidarity, of sharing, uh, point to depoliticization rather than politicization. So my question is really um, on the relationship between solidarity and politicization. So... Um... The argument is that solidarity should dampen rather than trigger politicization. Um, I, I find that I find that a very implausible argument. I must say, you know, if if you look at, at national democracy, what's what's the core of in a national democracy is the debate of the budget, the decision of the budget, who gives and who gains. I, 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 and, and, you know, this structures uh, politics a lot in the domestic context. And this question, who gives and who gains is also the most among the most um, politically charged in uh, the EU. And you know, if you say there wasn't really a choice, 
you know, in, in um, March and early April, it still appeared as if there was a lot of choice. There was the choice either to go uh, to Corona bonds or to do nothing beyond um, what established institutions like the ESM had to offer. So it was not a foregone conclusion that something like uh, the next generation EU recovery fund uh, would emerge. Now, if you say, if you ask, is this really a politicization story? And I could read your question differently and ask, is this a, a mass politics story? Or is this, as Doro has implied, is this a story of elite framing? And, and uh, I guess mass politics may have played less of a role in um, uh, this crisis. And indeed, elites as thought leaders, as uh, cue givers, were very important in this crisis for the reasons that uh, Doro uh, mentioned. They, they, they set the frame. And, you know, I, I think you should uh, uh, compare how Angela Merkel talked during um, uh, the, the Corona crisis to how she talked during um, the Eurozone crisis. And it was a very, very different rhetoric. And, uh, you know, that she suddenly talked uh, so much about solidarity was really a new thing and tried to prepare the ground for, you know, this, this um, uh, uh, German switch towards uh, 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 fiscal uh, solidarity, which again was not a foregone conclusion. It was not clear uh, to me that this would happen. Um, so does this make it a politicization story? I think we have to ask Hans-Peter. <laughs> um, yes, we will be able to ask uh, uh, Hans-Peter in two weeks uh, time when we reconvene for the next uh, seminar, we'll have a, a session with a talk by Hans-Peter uh, Kriesi. This session comes uh, to an end. Thank you very, very much again, Philip, for a very interesting talk. And thank you everyone for a lively uh, discussion. Thank you and goodbye.